on this visit to the film lounge. A couple gets high-tech help for their marriage woes. An urban artist reflects on his youth. A locked-down filmmaker becomes the ultimate auteur. A group of elite athletes grieve the loss of their season. And Film Lounge filmmakers help us celebrate our five-year anniversary. Strap yourself in for another fun ride at the Film Lounge. Funding for the Film Lounge has been provided by... Produce Iowa, building a statewide network of support for the film community in Iowa. More information on how you can connect is available at produceiowa.com. And Iowa Arts Council, empowering Iowa to build and sustain culturally vibrant communities by cultivating creativity, learning, and participation in the arts. Learn more at iowaculture.gov. My name is Jacob Withers. I'm from Des Moines. I do screenwriting, sound recording, and sound editing. So Welcome to a Better You is a comedy short that uh, I worked on with Justin Norman. I co-wrote it and also did the sound recording and uh, the heavier parts of the sound editing. So uh, when I walked into the room, the idea was already sitting there. All we had was the basic idea of there is a guy and his wife, and they're unhappy, and they get a clone. And we had a rough beginning and end to it, just we knew the last shot and the first shot, and very quickly put together an outline for it. Uh, we just lay things out in terms of a basic three-act structure with three sub uh, acts to each thing and three parts to each one. And uh, that way we've got a clean outline of just here are the actions that occur at each point. Here is how things develop. Here's how we transition from one to the next. We were trying to keep it to uh, about seven minutes of runtime and uh, we failed at that. We probably would have been looking at like 20 minutes if we hadn't cut it down quite a bit. You know, we ended up at that point at the end where you've got a lot of good ideas that you like and they're sitting off to the side and every so often you can be like, no, I'm still gonna put that into something at some point. I can't use it for that one. I, it had to be cut, it wasn't gonna work, but uh, it, it's still there. <laughs> would like to order the turkey leg home style cool ranch doritos the baby corn stick and the drinks are on me yeah i admire the sound of your voice i'll be there in 15 names that you got this. Oh, yeah, baby! It's gonna work this time. Yep. You got it. What the hell, Thad? It's four in the morning. I have to be at work in three hours. The whole house is a mess. 
Two for one turkey leg. Again. I swear to God, if you miss work one more time. You're what? Hmm? What? What? Yes, my reference number is 9105H. Um, yeah, I'd just like to complete it. Um, just sometime this week, if possible. I think it's what's best for both of us. No, no, without genitals is fine. things, huh? Yep. Cheek swab. <laughs> Didn't even look like me. Well, I guess we're doing this thing. Come in. Nadine! Nadine! The thing you ordered is here! I'm not paying for this! yourself at home. Do you feel pain? Oh, it's here. Hi, I'm Nadine. Tad, nice to meet you. Tad? Yeah. Tad's just going to be helping us out with some stuff around the house so that we can be less stressed and you can, you know, do your hobbies. Looks like you have a bit of a mess here. I'll take care of that. Oh, it's amazing. Well, I'm off to work. You boys have a good day. 6 p.m. You'll be wanting dinner then. I'll take care of that. Oh, Tad. My tummy's rumbling already. Hey. Um, do you get that from the yes, store? Yep, got it from the loaf and jug on Main. I'm gonna ask you to run a couple, like an errand for me. There's a uh, liquor store on the corner of Fifth and Bemidji, the corner, and um, they have a peanut butter vodka flavored, peanut butter flavored vodka that I want you to get me. I'm not allowed to purchase alcoholic beverages of any type. <sighs> Fine. I'll get it myself. I had a perfect day, Nadine. I took out all the garbage, recycled all of the alcohol containers, washed myself, did all my laundry, dusted the inside of the house and the outside of the house, and I made this 
whole meal with organic ingredients for only twelve dollars. Hmm. And that? I told him to do all that. Well, great. Productive day for everyone then. Mm hmm. Maybe tomorrow Tad can clean out the airstream. What? <coughs> well, then. Well, we can't sell it in that kind of shape. <coughs> what is my pad? You can sell my pad! My plate! Not selling it. You barely even use it anymore. Mm -mm. It's just mm -mm. full of rotting turkey leg bones. Mm -mm. We're buried in crippling debt, Thad. We need to either sell or return everything that we own. I know something we can return. You can't return a salad, Dad. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The smell of bird rot is less pungent than it's been in years. I just can't believe how much you've improved things around here. Thanks. You just... You really are a better you. Where are you going? Getting a drink. Well, don't worry about coming home early. Tad can go to work for you tomorrow. See ya, buddy! extension package. Um, can you express ship? That would be amazing. It's a little late to be making a salad, don't you think? Nadine was hungry. Power down, Tad. Tad, turn off. Where's your power button? Get out of my house. Whose house? Been all that time tossing salads, but I bet you never thought that someday someone would be tossing you in the trash. <laughs> hmm. 
looks like you committed homicide. I'll take care of that. Go ahead. Call the cops. I'll take the fall. I will, just a second. Everything all right? Yeah. Everything's gonna be fine. My name is Lucius Pham, I'm from Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, my music video is The Call by Teller Banks. Teller's an example of someone I met through being a fan first and then, uh, you know, starting a relationship with. Um, I love his music and, uh, you know, he really wanted to tell a story about, you know, uh, starting out, uh, you know, he, uh, he admittedly wasn't like the uh, stand-up guy and uh, got into some nefarious stuff and so we, I uh, kind of channeled that into, all right, maybe you're stealing a television set because I like the way that looks. So I think we were largely inspired by the beat of the song is kind of retro and it, we talked about it being kind of reminiscent of like black exploitation films from the 70s. So like Shaft and Superfly and like Foxy Brown. And so we kind of wanted to chase that a little bit while also telling the story of uh, you know, where Teller's from uh, and, uh, and what he had to do uh, in order to get where he is. We talked about different ways of doing the music video. You know, it was basically the whole production was me uh, with a handheld and uh, we picked kind of a gross day to shoot because we wanted the whole feel to be sort of dirty. I think there's an emphasis right now on making music videos look kind of polished and clean. And uh, I just didn't think that was gonna work with this music video. So we wanted to kind of get our hands dirty and we shot, you know, it was a long day. It really just took a day of shooting, but uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a good shoot. I think primarily I'm a writer. I think that works well with music videos and short films as a medium, specifically music videos, because it just kind of allows you uh, a lot of space for creativity in like a short amount of time. Music videos are very similar to just Feature films, just way shorter, uh, and every second counts rather than every minute.
at kind of near the beginning of um, the pandemic, like the early months of it, um, the 48 hour film project, which is um, something I was involved with last year. And um, they put out these challenges um, that I thought would be a good opportunity to like challenge myself to reconnect um, in like COVID friendly ways with um, friends of mine. Cupcake, it was all shot in a day. It's a horror film uh, about a baker who gets an order. And after she gets that order, weird things start happening. What? So we were participating in the 48 hour stuck at home challenge, which um, is a challenge where within 48 hours, you uh, write, shoot and edit and complete a finished short film. My role was um, to direct it. So I was thinking about, you know, um, how the actor was doing. I was also the actor. <laughs> so I had to think about um, my performance and like if I was conveying, you know, what I would, you know, what this character. And I was also shooting it. So I had to think about the lighting and um, make adjustments in that. I never saw the editor in person. I never saw the art director, musician, never saw the writers. It definitely felt like a collaborative experience, even though we were all in our own homes. The collaboration had to be really intentional and really, you know, really listening to people's ideas and implementing it. I would set it up and then I'd record just a little bit, you know, kind of see where I was placed. I would mark, you know, where I was standing, then I'd go review it, check to see if um, everything looked okay. There were a lot of shots that didn't, you know, <laughs> didn't come through very well. After the day of shooting and the day of, you know, doing all this work by myself, um, I felt like I wanted to make another film. <laughs> and maybe that's just something that, you know, all filmmakers share and that's why they keep doing it because it's a lot of work, but it feels so rewarding.
would have loved them. <laughs> Is that you, dear? I'm John Richard, and my film, The Simple Gift of Walnut Grove, was featured on the first installment of the film lounge. It was almost uncanny how he could take a piece of metal and shape it into something useful. Since then, I've been working on a variety of projects, uh, most notably a commission for the Des Moines Symphony Orchestra, American Gothic uh, for Orchestra, which was a cinematic visual that went along with a live symphony performance and a feature film called Saving Brinton, which was about some of the earliest films in the world that were discovered in a farmhouse uh, in rural Iowa. Currently, most of my energy is spent uh, working on a project about a mountain climbing club that, uh, surprisingly enough, was formed in the 1940s in Iowa City and grew to be one of the largest and most influential clubs in the country. It's really exciting to see that the film lounge continues into the future and for so many different voices to have such a distinguished platform in which to present their, their work. I'm really excited about the future of film production in Iowa and creating an industry and building a sort of culture that is, is of this place and by this place. And I look forward to working with everyone and celebrating our achievements in the future. Uh, my name is Christian Day, and uh, my film Cocktua played during the very first season of the Film Lounge. I've still continued to make um, films with uh, 
my friends. Uh, I did a piece um, that was produced for um, uh, Crypt TV called Bath Bomb. Uh, we shot that in LA. Actually, it was with the almost all Iowa crew, but we shot it in LA. I made another film with some buddies called Mush Town. We shot that in um, Stratford, Iowa, with a bunch of my friends from The Bachelor. Uh, they they flew out uh, to to Des Moines. We drove up there. We we all piled into a cabin and then filmed on this property, this farm, um, for a week. It was one of the hottest, hottest experiences of my life. Most recently, um, this project, I, I, I did this documentary called, um, that just got completed, uh, Somewhere Between New York and LA, which is about a filmmaking peer of mine, uh, a director named Blake Eckert, who lives in Stanbury, Missouri, uh, who has been making films in this small town of a thousand people for uh, nearly 20 years. Um, I, I had started shooting it three years ago, and then when, um, when COVID hit, um, I suddenly had some time, not a whole lot of time, I had some time on my hands and uh, decided to finish it. Made a movie. Cake and ice cream is out the window, we're making a horror film. I have another piece that's about finished um, called Fairtown that is about the parking lots of the Iowa State Fair. And uh, that was also a piece um, I did with, uh, with Bruce Bales and uh, John Hennessy Baker. That was our team. Um, and we went out to um, the State Fair and we filmed all of the, the, the yards that people um, uh, would park their cars in. Have you had anyone really from interesting places? Oh yeah, they come from all over. I've had people from overseas, people from uh, Japan. Last year we had somebody from France. My name is Thomas C. Johnson. I'm an associate professor of communication studies here at Luther College in Decorah. Two of my recent films, Ironhead and Marika, appeared on season one and season two of the Film Lounge, both those films being short subject documentary films and documentary being the, the genre that I work in as a filmmaker. Since that time, a couple different things going, both film-wise as well as writing-wise. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just highlight one of those things, and that being the film Driftless by Air. This film is a, a short film that very much fits the poetic mode of documentary storytelling. So it consists of aerial footage or drone footage of this region, this region being Northeast Iowa, Southeastern Minnesota, Southwestern Wisconsin, and Northwestern Illinois. So yeah, been working on that right now, doing some editing of it. And all the film footage of this piece actually came from folks who, who did some shooting for uh, a film called Decoding the Driftless. And for this particular film, I actually served as a post-production consultant. So two kind of films that are oriented on the driftless, this region that, that here in Decorah we call home. Hi, I'm Andrew Sherburn from Iowa City. I'm one of the filmmakers behind Husker Sand, along with my co-director, Tommy Haynes. Since Husker Sand was featured on season one of the Film Lounge, Tommy and I went on to partner with another Iowa City filmmaker, John Richard, on the feature documentary, Saving Britain. Saving Britain world premiered at the AFI Docs Film Festival. It played at theaters across Iowa, across the nation, and finally landed on PBS as part of America Reframed. Tommy and I also recently received a green light grant from the state of Iowa to pursue a new documentary feature film titled The Workshop, about the fabled Iowa Writers Workshop right here in Iowa City. We're excited about this new project. We're excited about cinema in the state of Iowa. I'm coming to you today from Film Scene, uh, Iowa City's nonprofit cinema, where we hope to get back to showing movies sometime soon. Thanks for watching and enjoy this latest episode of The Film Lounge. My name is Ben Friedman. I'm from Ankeny, Iowa. I'm a recent college graduate and an aspiring storyteller and filmmaker. Hi, I'm Michael Rundy. I'm from Dubuque, Iowa. I'm a recent graduate of Loris College and I'm an aspiring videographer and storyteller.
it was here and then it was gone just like that. One Stolen Moment is a short documentary focusing on four athletes at Loris College who in the spring of 2020 had their national championship runs canceled due to COVID-19. We got really lucky. I mean, to be honest, the athletes that we interviewed, like we said, were all, all four of them very accomplished, but also great <laughs> orators for describing their experience. We're a Division Three school, and you hear yeah. Division Three, you instantly think like, okay, maybe a lower tier of sports competition, but you're like, no, no, no. Then you hear like Olympics, and you hear All-American, and you hear Sports Center, and you're like, oh, okay. These athletes are the real deal, and honestly would be able to compete at the Division One level. Yeah, and when the entire basis is that, these four teams were potentially going to make a run at a national championship. You need to show that like, oh, they actually could win this national championship. No one will stop her. Gabby Nolan, unstoppable. Have yourself a championship, Gabby Nolan. It felt like it had the heart in it, but we wanted to basically make it feel like these athletes are rock stars and as cool as they like act. This can't be happening. And it was interesting to be kind of in the middle of, of somewhat of a grieving process for these athletes. Um, and for all four of them to open up as much as they did and be so vulnerable was uh, pretty spectacular. Gave us some awesome material that we were able to share. Yeah, and it's like, it's always a weird thing too when you are asking someone about one of the worst things that's ever happened to them, like a couple weeks after it happened. Like, you know, it, that's like, so if they would have, not wanted to be a part of it at all, like we kind of would have understood. I walked away, I think, from the whole entire process having a deeper understanding of resiliency. I don't think I've had something as high stakes in my life as something that maybe they went through. And to see that they were putting themselves already in a position where they knew what they were gonna do going forward. And that this one particular weekend didn't define their whole entire career was pretty eye-opening for me. The documentary as a whole was dedicated to everyone who went through something similar, whether maybe it's not a sporting event, but lost something because of COVID, uh, lost an opportunity. That, I think that can hit home beyond or the sport context of the documentary. The idea is you want not just the Loris community to understand and like care about the doc, but you want other people outside of that to sort of get what these people are going through and sort of get the message behind all of it. And when it sort of hits home with people outside of that realm, it's, it's a nice, it was a nice feeling. It was here and then it was gone just like that. There's nothing we could have done. You know, I don't really think there's anything in your life that'll prepare you for that moment. There's still something I'm waiting for. To have it all come to a close in such an abrupt way, it's unimaginable. We started ranked number one in the country. It was our year. We won conference this past year and we won regionals and beat Warburg, knocking off a 28-year streak. That was pretty awesome. Out in Iowa at Loris College, Guy Patrona. He's the first Division III wrestler we have talked about on the show. I know this is true. Guy's a badass. My name is Guy Patron Jr., and I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I wrestle here at Loris College. I think we were pretty confident and excited about what we coming back and what we thought we could do. We had four on all conference. Marissa, Mack, first team, me and Courtney, second team. We had knocked off three ranked teams, first time in history. For our programs making the Sweet 16, we had the best year in Morris College history. I'm Carrie Fitzpatrick, I'm a senior here at Loris and I play women's basketball. You've been doing it all season long, just like follow what Jones has told you. 
trust that process. This is real. We're all pretty excited on what we can do. Jamari Scott, Ben Lewis. I'm Shamari, I'm a senior. I run track. We were doing probably the best we've ever done as a girls team. We were really kind of honing everything together. The whole season was probably one of the best I've ever had. No one will stop her! Gabby Nolan, unstoppable! I'm Gabby Nolan. I have been running all four years at Loris. Have yourself a championship, Gabby Nolan. From day one when he got up here, you could just, people knew. When I was a coach at Holy Cross in New Orleans, guy would come over and work out with me one-on-one. -on -one. When I got this job, I put him at the top of the list just because he gave me such headaches as a coach when I was down there. And I wanted him on my team. He just kind of changed the culture literally like overnight. Plus he's just an awesome dude. He's an RA, he's in the National Guard. He washes our laundry every day. He's just a guy that people want to be around. Care's a real, Interesting story. Her ability to impact other people on her recruiting visit, I remember plain as day. She could do a thousand different things, and some of that changed from game to game. She always guarded their best player because she was so good defensively. She's super invested, cares about team only all the time, and I think having that rub off into younger players is a really good thing to see. Shamari has been one of those kids that has been a, a good team glue guy the big time of the year, when it was conference, when it was nationals. He wanted to do everything that he could for his teammates to be successful. I love that kid, and he's worked really hard um, to get better, to get where he's at. And then Gabby, you know, the, the GOAT term is out there, right? She was knocking on the doorstep of hitting the U.S. trials qualifying times for the 2020 Olympics. When you talk about records and regional awards and national recognition and national championships, um, I, I just can't find anyone in our history that has had that kind of success. Let's preview a historic weekend coming up for Duhok Athletics. We have four teams competing on the national stage in We've never had it where it's all been in one particular weekend like that. Best case scenario, wrestling wins a national championship, the women's basketball goes to the final four, and both track teams trophy. I think it all began on a Wednesday when uh, the NCAA announced that the Division I basketball tournament was going to be called off, and I think it sent the world into a spin. TV screens everywhere, and it was just sports are canceled, NCAA. It's made the decision to cancel the men's and women's. Basketball tournament was about to begin, and that it will not be happening. And we thought, okay, what is this going to mean for us? Nothing about Division Three had come to be. Going into the national championship, some teams are already dropping out. They weren't traveling, their schools put a ban on it. We thought, okay, we'll at least get through the weekend. All day, we had been getting emails like, Banquets canceled, um, your parents can't come, your parents can come, and then your parents can't come, then no one can come again. We're in the hotel room getting ready for, um, just to go out to dinner. We just hear knocks on the door going down, and it's Jones. TJ called us all into uh, the hotel room, and we walk in, and it was definitely like, a you can tell, a change of mood in the room. I practiced at four, got into stretching, and then our first drill, and within five minutes of our first drill. The next thing you know, we get an email, and it says, Division Three, all remaining divisions are canceled. And it just kind of felt like time stopped. This can't be happening. We all kind of sat there in disbelief for a little while. Everyone just really didn't know how to react in that moment. This is a dream, bad dream. Got to wake up from it. 
started tearing up and like crying and then made like Gabby and Terry uh, tear up and I look over at them and I'm just like kind of put my head down. As I was walking down the hall I heard student athletes in tears and that really hurt me. I started to tear up actually. Their dreams just got shattered. I rise and fall with all of our students because I get to see them at their very best and I get to see them in their not so very best. And in each, in each way, I care about them. And so it's hard. I take it home with me. That night that when I went home and actually had a moment to think about it, I cried. I'm going to cry right now. After four years of wanting to be a national champion, you know, now I just, like, I don't get that last opportunity. You know, I kind of tell myself every day, like, yeah, I mean, it's over. I looked at Patrick Michael, who had been training to try and go to the Olympics. I thought of Shamari and how he worked so hard to get back into the sport when he had to take a year off. And then it really didn't hit me until my coach started crying, and I was like, I'm done. You know, you can kind of prepare for end of the year speeches. I don't know if I'm great at them, but you still have a semblance of like how this goes. There's nothing about how that goes. It was heartbreaking, especially for us three seniors. I mean, that's never really how you envision your senior year is going to end. I think it's really hard to explain because you're there and you should be running, but you're just not. I think that was the hardest part, in all honesty. You know, if we would have found out on Tuesday that um, it was canceled, before we ever made the trip. I think it would have made the decision by the NCAA a lot easier. Where I'm probably heartbroken the most is like, how far could we have gone? There was a lot of unknowns with our season and I think we were playing our best basketball and that we were confident. I think it was really going to put something there for um, history for them and for the institution and then, and then future for everyone else. Would have been our best winter, spring or fall season in the history of, of the college. And I make no apologies. You know, we had national championships hanging out there and uh, those were taken in my humble opinion. We all thought that there was a great shot that we were gonna have four national champions coming back on Sunday. As a team, we decided it'd be best if we still went out, got dressed up, and made light of the situation. They needed to mourn, they needed time, honestly. We had a good group of seniors, so told them to go mourn, and then we're gonna, we're gonna celebrate this season as a family. We went out to eat, had a nice steak, and tried to make the most of it, you know. We wanted to do stuff together that day, the rest of the day, into the night, uh, just so we were together and hanging out and at least kind of probably sponging the feeling of what that actually felt like. Before anything really had a chance to set in back on campus, everyone was gone. And so there really wasn't an opportunity to, to kind of put your minds at ease, to get back in the regular swing of things. But it's a bigger picture. Like, look at, look at this campus. It's, there's nobody here, right? And there's nobody anywhere in any campus in the country and to understand that like what can you do about it you can't right you can't do anything at the time people were still wondering oh is this, is this really the right decision why can't we play and i think now it's like yeah that it was the right decision the ncaa taking that season from us like obviously ending it right where it was was a like, good call for our health but at the same time it's like it's like very heartbreaking it's like you it, we were like so close it was just literally just snatched right from us my last two years was basically, you know, taken from me. You know, one due to injury, another due to like uh, epidemic that we can't really control. I feel like it was the right move, canceling the tournament. I just wish that they could have just gone through with it. That you know, just one weekend. That's the thing. Like for me, it's easy because I'll have 20 more of these. You know, um, I, I, I'm still gonna feel for our, probably our seniors the most. There's some days where I'm like, all right, I'm done, like I'm moving on, I'm an adult now. And then there's other days where I'm like, I want to go back. I've just spent my whole life running. It's weird, it's different. Um, I've just grown up my whole life playing sports and I've always been involved in something and feel badly for my teammates. And just knowing that their season got cut short and for the ones who maybe don't get a fifth year, you know, that's pretty hard. At the end of the day, we had a great season and we're able to end with the winningest team in Loris College history. You know, just being undefeated on the year, that's definitely something to take away and to be proud of. Reflecting back on our day-to-day -day practice, the relationships that I've built, those are what the things that I miss the most, I think. Yeah, you're going to remember the Sweet 16, you're going to remember the Elite Eight, all that stuff. But I think what's most important is just the friendships, the relationships you've built, all the memories we've made. 
when I look back, I'll always remember Coach Jay being by my side and supporting me, um, always telling me that he believed in me. After that initial hurt, it was good to see all the programs kind of rallying around the sports that were affected. There's been the hashtag Loris together going around campus, reminding each other we're in this together and we're all going to come out better and stronger. Hey guys and gals, I'm Greg Gumbel, class of 1967 at Loris College. I heard that... Hey Dewhawks, this is head men's volleyball coach Jeremy Thornburg. I just wanted to send you a quick pick-me-up message. There may be a lot of unknowns out there. Good thing is we can do this together. Hey, we're going to rock this go and do go Dewhawks. Two words which I will leave with you. Go do Hawks. I think that um, the community showed what, what it means to be a Duhawk and, and put their heart out for people for sure. They put out a blanket waiver that says you can come back for another year if you're a spring sport athlete. It's a tough spot to be in for winter sports because you know you don't get that back. The fact that we get an outdoor back at least that gives like you know a lot of us a chance to have some sort of closure but at the same time um, there's a possibility of like not having everyone back because some seniors have to get on with their life. There are some people who are going back for their fifth year of eligibility. I'm not really too keen on taking that. I'm engaged currently. I've got a job waiting for me in criminal justice. I'm ready to be an adult. For so long I've been known as Gabby Noland, the runner, you know, it's just kind of been my staple and what people know me by. So it's definitely going to be a change just being Gabby Noland, just the regular cool, cool kid, you know. I'm at um, City High, my high school, um, on the track. I just finished a workout not too long ago. We still got unfinished business. That's kind of like the message that was left with us. The next step from here for me personally would be go to the last chance qualifying tournament for the Olympic trials to make a world team and hopefully eventually the Olympics. It was my first recruiting class overall. You know, there was even some guys that weren't starters that were just huge for our culture. And they set the foundation, like a championship foundation. This class, they left a legacy that is just maybe unmatched. As a freshman, I didn't think that we'd get to this point ever. Like, All-American was still, like, crazy to me. Now it's just natural for us to take, like, 10 girls to the national championships. It's natural for us to take, like, 15 guys to the national championships. People know Loris and they look for them. We've accomplished so much as a campus and as student athletes that this doesn't really take any of that away. Yes, the physical game was taken away and that opportunity, but we still look back and there's so much to celebrate. And the biggest takeaway I'll take away from this is to never give up. To see everything come full circle has been awesome. And I always think back to that time where I didn't touch a basketball for four months and I was gonna give it up. Sometimes it's gonna be way out of your control and it's just based off how you respond to it. When you're living in the moment, uh, you feel like you have forever. But you just have to like cherish it as long as you have it. My biggest takeaway is to always appreciate what you have and to always value it, cherish it, and find the positives in what you've already done. One thing I've learned in college, you know, whether or not you play a sport, you know, you just, you kind of got to enjoy your life um, and not put too much pressure, too much stress on yourself about, you know, the little things. We've got incredible athletics, um, incredible people, and COVID-19 is not going to stop us. As it relates to the seniors, um, I think it's important to know that they're loved.
Funding for the Film Lounge has been provided by... Produce Iowa, building a statewide network of support for the film community in Iowa. More information on how you can connect is available at produceiowa.com. And Iowa Arts Council, empowering Iowa to build and sustain culturally vibrant communities by cultivating creativity, learning, and participation in the arts. Learn more at iowaculture.gov.